So, uh, is this officially the last talk of the semester? I think so. I see some students here. Yay, you made it. <laughs> well, um, uh, and I'm glad you did because it's really a great, uh, great pleasure to have both um, Sharon Davis and Louise Braverman today uh, to introduce their inspiring work and practices. Um, both are pioneering nearing new forms of uh, engagement and practice in ways that I think are really meaningful uh, and uh, important for us uh, at the school. And we're particularly delighted to have uh, Sharon back, who's one of our most interesting and unique uh, alumni. Um, uh, Sharon is actually story is very unique, um, and one that you know as architects I think we really fantasize about. But she had a successful career in finance, and then decided that her love was really architecture uh, and the and the built environment. And so she decided to pursue her dream to become an architect. But not any kind, any kind of architect, but one who strongly believed in the transformative and continues to believe in the transformative power of design and the possibility for architecture to really enable communities to, uh, to create environments that will connect to their past but also project them uh, into the future and, and, and hopefully a better uh, future in which they can shape you know, new kinds of uh, work processes uh, and, and life for themselves. Sharon earned her master of architecture here at Columbia to sat in 2006. She's been in the limelight recently uh, with a number of awards, including a Game Changer Award from the Tropics Mag Magazine, recognizing her work in Rwanda in particular. In 2010, she received the Women for Women Active Citizens Award, and in 2006, the Lucille Meister Lowenfish Memorial Prize from Columbia University. Today, we're also, she will share with us two projects, I think, uh, in Rwanda, the Wonderful Women's Opportunity Center, as well as the hospital share houses. Alongside Sharon uh, is another um, um, very inspiring uh, architect, uh, uh, Louise Braverman, whose work is succeeding in weaving together uh, a, a refined aesthetic sensibility, design invention, and a sense of an architecture that can be inclusive and accessible across a broad audience. Um, uh, Louise is a graduate of uh, Yale. Well, excuse you, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I think her practice is also really inspiring in, in focusing on kind of very elemental uh, solutions, but that always find ways to uh, to kind of unlock complex architectural problems, and you'll see the results are quite, uh, quite interesting and uncommon. Her work has won numerous awards and been recognized by her peers, resulting in her addition to fellowship in the AIA. And I'm sorry, I'm missing the lunch today, but uh, I'm glad you're here to, uh, today with us. And many invitations to present the work of the firm in particular uh, at uh, the recent Venice Architecture of Uralis. And today she will focus also on two projects, uh, the Central Arts Nadir Afonso, an art museum in Botticas in Portugal that encourages public participation with art and the village health works, staff housing, and now the dormitory in the post-genocide village of Kikutu, Burundi. So very unique uh, practices. Please uh, uh, join me in welcoming both uh, Sharon and Luis today. And uh, thank you. Who is starting? Sharon, are you starting? Okay. Hi. It's really nice to be here. Um, I know I don't look like someone who graduated uh, almost 11 years ago, just over 10 years ago, but um, it's wonderful to be back here. And. Um, but the time that I graduated, which is relatively uh, shortly after, was the financial crisis, and there was not a lot going on in New York in terms of architecture. So I was very fortunate to um, have this sort of serendipitous connection with this nonprofit um, who asked me to come to Rwanda and build um, and design a vocational school for women. Um, so Rwanda, just to locate for you, is in East Africa. It's landlocked, it's tiny. And in 1994, they went through a terrible genocide where um, almost a million people were killed in 100 days. 
So um, the most of the people killed were men, but the women were also traumatized by a lot of rape and other um, types of things. So at the end of the genocide, there were 70% women in the, in the adult population. Um, and the people who, um, basically they're still recovering from that emotionally. So the organization that hired me is Women for Women International, and they work in eight countries that have been through civil war and genocide. Um, they um, help women to sort of repair their lives and help to build communities by teaching women vocational skills so that they can go out and run their own businesses and feed their children and take care of their medical needs, etc. So this is a group of women in Rwanda having their graduation. It's a one-year program, so you can see them very excited and all dressed up in their best clothes. Um, I just like to remember that who the who the client is. Um, so on my very first trip to Rwanda, uh, one of the things that I that really struck me and stayed with me through the design process was watching women collecting water. So as you go down these rural roads in Rwanda, you'll see women constantly, these yellow jerry cans, and they're, they're going to get water for the day, and it takes them sometimes four to five hours a day to get to and from and wait in line for the water. So I initially thought, wow, this is, like, so these women are taking care of children and doing everything else they have to do around their household, and they're spending five hours collecting water and they're going to work and make money somehow too. Just was very much in my mind how difficult this, this whole life was for them. It's just sort of living conditions. This is an image of uh, four women collecting wood to, um, to cook the ones for pot meal the length of the day. But it's really here to show you kind of the scale of the life that the rural community lives in, um, which became also part of the design process. And this is our site. Um, Rwanda's a gorgeous country. It just hills and valleys. It's on the equator. has great soil. And, um, and agriculture is the main um, uh, product. And most, most people are at least subsistence farmers. Um, this funny shape you see here four times is the shape of our site. Um, for some reason, it was not an actual square, which I can tell you about if you really want to know the reason why. Um, so with the client, I sort of determined four major um, things that were important. And the first one to me was just trying to understand how I was going to make a place that felt um, welcoming and inviting to women who lived in this sort of scale of home and building um, in, a, in a space that was supposed to uh, capacity was for 300 women. So imagining you know, a schoolhouse, a two-story schoolhouse with rows of classrooms, I just I couldn't figure out how they would feel, or I, I felt they'd be very intimidated by being in such an environment. So that got us to thinking with the client about how we could do things differently, and sort of came up with this idea of a, of a village concept. The second was creating community, because the women tend to be more successful when they finish this program if they have bonded with other women and work together. The third is growth. Obviously, they wanted uh, the organization wanted room for growth, and then security because of the genocide. Women feel very vulnerable, and so feeling that they're in a safe space, having a security gate around it was also very important. Um, so I started out working on a um, topo model, and you can see there's a steep slope, and we were looking at things. It's on the equator, so it's actually quite a, it's a nice temperature, but the sun is very hot. Um, so uh, we were looking at prevailing breezes, dealing with how to work things around the slope. And on the right hand, on your right hand side was the, um, the top of the slope, and it was adjacent to the road. So up there we got a gatehouse and some um, uh, market spaces for women when they graduated to be able to sell their goods. And then as you walk down the slope, the sort of rectangular building you see here was the administrative building, but it also created a secondary sort of security. So from here to here, you walked kind of through this. Um, so it just also gave another step of security for the women. 
And then this large area in the middle is the gathering space where all 300 women can get together at the end of the year and have their celebration of graduation. And then we started looking at how these classrooms could become clusters and create a warm sort of embrace, I think, of that open space. And then up here, um, which is the, uh, the lowest point, is where the demonstration farm is. So here's the site plan, which also includes the orange, includes some dorms and um, uh, showers, et cetera, for people who are coming from far away. And the purple is a canteen and kitchen where some women learned cooking skills and hospitality. And they have like, the best pizza in Kayonza, which is always wonderful because the diet in Rwanda is pretty much um, one dimensional, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then the market in red on the, on the, at the bottom. Um, so I really, this reminds me so much of my, my experience being a student at Columbia. So I arrived on my first trip and I, the first thing I wanted to know was, well, what's the history of building and architecture in this country? And um, it mostly didn't exist anymore. It, there were a couple of little tourist places where you could see this. But this is, so I drove two hours um, south to this museum that had a replica of a king's palace. This was a king's palace. I fell in love with it, obviously. It's an incredible um, structure, all made out of reeds. And um, this is the ceiling on the interior. Um, and I wasn't really sure what was going to happen after seeing this, but it just, uh, I went back to, the, to talk to the women and to sit in on a class afterwards. And I found out from the, the teacher that um, they always seat the women in a circle so that everyone can, so the women are taught in groups of 25, and they're always seated in a circle so that they can share their stories. And the idea is that when they do this, they tend to bond more with each other and become more successful when they graduate. If they've done that, they will form a cooperative and work together, et cetera. So the circle became important to me when I was like, ah, the circle. So, um, <laughs> Um, and then I sat in on this class, and one of the things working for a school initially was the community was there, and I had a translator, so I was able to really hear the stories of the people and get a sense of who they were with relative ease for me. Um, they were talking about human rights, women's rights, um, reproductive issues, women were telling their stories of rape and losing husbands, and. Um, so I immediately realized that it needed to be a very intimate space. Um, I didn't want windows, doors, I wanted it to feel very private when the women were in there, that there were no distractions from the outside. But obviously I still wanted ventilation and daylight. Um, there's not a lot of electricity, there was no electricity at the site when we started, so that was important. So here you see the circle and you sort of see the that privacy aspect of it. And then uh, from the classroom structure that we started with, we started looking at how can we do, um, make sure we cover this um, space year round, so solar coverage was an issue. And then the roof sort of comes back to um, my initial experience of seeing the women collecting water. So we ended up with the client's approval creating this rainwater collection system. And the goal was to collect enough water in the two to three months of rain to feed the campus um, for, for the entire year. So we have huge cisterns underneath that collect the water and then a locally available um, uh, uh, water cleaning um, so solution, which is UV and sand, and then it's gravity fed to the different locations. Um, so the idea was that women weren't going to reproduce this kind of thing in their homes, but the idea was just to show that rainwater was an option for um, collecting water that might save them some time. Um, this is just a diagram showing, you know, no direct sunlight, but um, but indirect sunlight filtering in and the um, uh, ventilation coming through. Um, this is an image of three of a cluster of three. You can kind of see. I think the um, the rainwater chains are here that sort of take the water off the roof and then down into the cisterns. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of images. This is the women in the classroom. 
And then the other interesting thing about this project was the woman who donated the funds for the school really wanted the women to learn brick making as a different vocation. So being very naive at that time, I said, sure, <laughs> we'll teach the women how to make bricks. So uh, the first thing we did was we went around and looked at the existing brick making cooperatives in the community. They were all made by men. These women were not in the construction industry at all. And they were very unstable, just to sort of crumble in your hands. So we started looking at, OK, well, what, what are best practices for brick making? And we added a few simple things. One is sort of a, a, a sized pit. So um, this is just earth, water, and a little bit of sand, which was one of the most amazing things about um, making bricks there. So it required very little. And the women are mixing it. <coughs> you mix it very well because it's in this container. And then introducing a steel mold with sharp edges, whereas the um, other costs use um, just wood, wood frames. Um, they have the, the funny thing in the middle is the aluminum logo. And then flat surfaces so that the bricks wouldn't um, kind of warp on the, on the earth. And then in the background there, a shaded area for them to dry without getting wet again. So it was quite a learning process for all of us to figure this out. They made over half a million bricks for this project. And um, let me just show you a few construction images. Um, we also end up, by the end of the project, we had 30% of the workers on the site were women. And it continues to be true there to this day. When I ever go back, I always see women now on the construction crew. So that was like a very satisfying um, experience. This is where the dorms are and the showers and bathrooms and demonstration farm from down below. And then more of the demonstration farm next to the canteen. And this is the front on the street. So we did create that wall all the way around for security, but we didn't want it to look like a security fence. So it, um, it sort of undulates and becomes part of the different programmatic spaces. So if you go from left to right, it's a, it's a fence on the left. And then it curves back and becomes the back wall of these little shops that women can rent. And it comes forward again to disguise the um, or clad the water tank. Um, the gravity keeps the water back down. And then it goes back again to create this little market niche where people can sell, women can sell vegetables. So that's the end of that project. Um, I'm going to show you another project that was um, quite close by in Rumpado. It was um, a dormitory for partners in health hospitals. So they needed to make um, spaces for their doctors as inexpensively as possible. So this project, in terms of construction, cost about the equivalent of $45 a square foot. Um, it was a series of um, eight bedrooms. And we made two wings um, to break up the mass. And then a, um, a space in the middle that's a shared living, eating, um, cooking space. And it was, again, on the slope, so we were also dealing with that. The, the most interesting part about the project was we asked, um, I don't really talk about local materials, but obviously the earth for the bricks was local material. And, and so we're following up with that um, on the uh, exterior where we were just creating privacy on the, along the outdoor hallways, we asked the community to collect um, eucalyptus uh, uh, branches for us uh, that we paid them to do. And so this whole this whole thing is made out of just collected eucalyptus from the site. This is just showing another diagram, like the um, one for the classrooms with how the daylighting and cross ventilation and shading is working. Um, this is showing you the shared space. So at the top is the kitchen and then a dining area and then a lounge. So that it, that's sort of how we dealt with the slope with the two wings coming off. Um, and we also were able to provide a couple of small amenities, like each room has its own little outdoor terrace. Um, we were trying to make it nice even though it was small and inexpensive. 
Um, and I'll just show you a couple images. This is the interior hallway, sort of the eucalyptus makes this nice um, shadows on the walls. The shared space. This is one of the dorm rooms. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, even though I'm rancid to admit it, I'm personally familiar with that category of products that you may know as as seen on TV. You know these sort of sub health products that come on in the middle of the night and um, you, know, you see an actress uh, on one of those ads, you probably know something like me because I was up in the middle of the night and this went on repetitively. I was awake and uh, pensive. Now, pensive, pensive about what? you may ask, and um, that was a question. And ultimately I realized that it was about architecture. Not how to do it, I've been doing it for a while, so I kind of know how to do it, but why to do it. And over time, I really found no quick, big solution to my uh, question of an on and on. So luckily, soon after those uh, long-winded nights, I ran across the language of the artist Jenny Holzer, who in her 1980s piece, The Survival Series, said, use what is dominant in the culture to change it um, quickly. So here we have a person who's using her aesthetics to evaluate the tempo, of her, uh, the tempo of her times, and she used her art to comment upon how to facilitate social change. Her words not only echoed my instincts that architecture could embrace both aesthetics and community, but responded to what I had heard repetitively on the ground, which was, just because we are poor, like we've seen many of the people in Sharon's lives, that doesn't mean that we don't want a building that isn't beautiful. So, Toward that end, I believe that Jenny Holzer's approach is a paradigm for how architecture can traverse both artistic and cultural boundaries and extend to reach all strata of society. And today her words clearly serve as marching orders, you know, orders for me, as I strive to create architecture of both art and aesthetics and unconscious. Um, so it's always our goal to create culturally, aesthetically, and sustainably situated buildings. And this was particularly true in Monticus, Portugal, where we designed the building that you see here, Centro de Arts named Girafonso. It's a 20,000 square foot museum to honor one of Portugal's beloved native sons named Girafonso. And here you see him here, it's a large, uh, graphic in the museum. But what did it actually mean to situate a building in this struggling <coughs> section of Portugal, which was in the north of Portugal, almost in Spain? Um, and so our search became multifaceted. And we started a series of conversations that addressed everything from the broader perspective of the 1974 influx of modernism, which was quite late into Portugal, uh, and, and which was caused by the stronghold of a dictator who was there for 42 years. And then we also went all the way to the other end of the spectrum and, and asked questions about the beloved Portu Portuguese masonry of white concrete culture. So it's prophetic, and there you see that's the concrete that it's very white in, in Portugal. Um, it was prophetic when I arrived for the first time at the site in Botikas because it was raining and it was not just a little drizzle, it was a torrential downpour. And maybe the pounding of the rain was a reflection of the macro issues that were going to affect Portugal going forward because Botikas, the sleepy little village, um, which effectively had one city hall, one other, one other public building, which was a library made out of a medieval, a medieval jail, that was all that was there, other than houses, um, it was at the beginning of a crisis, an economic crisis which went through Europe and really was rugged in Portugal. But 
in spite of this, I was hopeful because I had a true affinity to the family of Nadia Alfonso. They were fabulous. Our local architect was amazing. And particularly to the ambition of the mayor of Botticus, uh, who was a mayor of a small town with a big dream to collaborate with us to create a compelling museum with the generosity of spirit. So that was what we did. The visit inspired us to take the initiative to expand the program of the museum, as well as paying homage to the artist who formerly practiced with Le Corbusier and also with Oscar Niemeyer. Uh, the design of the museum they, you know, is a light, contemporary feel uh, with a lot of light coming into it, which is tricky in museums, and also included the rich materiality of Portuguese design. Yet, um, we also opted uh, to explore the Central, along with the Major Alfonso Foundation, which was uh, recently inaugurated, designed by um, Alvaro Caesar in the near, nearby town of Shaw. So this was a, a regional development that we were interested in creating. So museums are cultural institutions that amplify their relevance when they are tied to the enhancement of the public realm. At least that's what I believe. They're not just a singular building. And that said, we would be, have, have been remiss not to see this opportunity to design this museum in its broadest context. So emerging uh, architecture and landscapes, we initiated the idea to craft, craft a real civic presence of the museum and, and making it a link between the emerging urban center and pastoral environments. So this was an early sketch and an early drawing. And you can see, we wanted to form a core in this cultural region and simultaneously develop a democratic, and you know, it's a very important word, civic space uh, in the Botica's community. Um, our plan was to expand the impact of the museum beyond its walls, and our hope was to create a platform to really help transform the lives of this small community, in, uh, which was on the verge of some real economic problems. That's exactly what we did. We created a bifurcated building that became the connected tissue uh, between the village and the surrounding countryside, and it sliced into the hillside that was there, and then it was quite sustainable, and was composed of two connected parts, a light-filled cultural center um, in, in the front and that faced the national highway and the town, and in the rear, nestled in the back, a below grade uh, exhibition space that was topped with the Green Room Park. This was an, something that we initiated with these wonderful clients, and they said, go for it. So first, the urban phase um, was emblematic of fusing a landscape and architecture, and the interior spaces of the entry hall really connect seamlessly indoors and out. So here you see the entry space, and those are the children's chairs, because children are here all the time. It's constant. And, and so it really brought the community into the space. Um, and a photo mural of the artist, as well as his sketches, we brought his, his art right out to the public. These were studying your bonds of sketches that wrapped around the entry wall, and um, he, he prepared them specially uh, for this museum. <coughs> Um, the stairway uh, brought you to the children's library, the outdoor cafe, and to the auditorium on the second floor. And all the spaces are designed to be used 24-7, so it was total sustainability. It was very flexible, just like I understand you do here in Columbia. Every space is being used for five different events. That's the way this museum ran as well. So then on the pastoral side, um, embedded in the hillside below a sustainably planted uh, green roof, uh, it, the exhibition space gestures you know, to the rural area, the more pastoral area of Botticus. And it ri literally grows out of the Botticus soil for the adjacent walls that retain the earth or cyclopean walls is uh, composed of the sustainably repurposed stones that was actually dug out of the site during construction. And um, in the exhibition hall, 
uh, visitors can view then art against the background of native rustic stone, stone, almost creating a feeling of viewing art within a grotto because the stone is right out there. And this is a shot of the Green Roof Park looking down on it, one of these aerial shots. And you can see that it was designed in the spirit of Nadir Afonso's a geometric abstraction work and in the tradition of the landscape architect Roberto Pearl Marx. Uh, he's Brazilian, but the Portuguese and the Brazilian have a very tight relationship. And, and he was their hero, so he was in his, that work was also an inspiration of this park. Um, and so you see it delineates an abstract design and the aesthetics are further reinforced because the park has some variable changes in section that really created um, a fun place and for aesthetic delight for the entire community. Okay, so now we're getting more into um, Sharon's territory. Um, subsequent to this, um, we're going to fast forward to Burundi, um, which is in East Africa. Uh, we were engaged to, to do multiple projects for a nonprofit called Village Health Works. Uh, we started out with a master plan on a 48th site, um, which sort of came about and really didn't exactly happen, um, as with many, with sort of some initial ideas. Uh, but this was a post-genocide village. Uh, they had a uh, genocide between uh, various tribes in the 90s. So this was sort of the beginning of a rebuilding um, effort. And we also worked on the very preliminary on the, um, the Women's Health Pavilion. But what we ended up building at the end of the day was an 18-bed uh, dormitory for medical staff on the site, because it was a health site. Um, and we really explored what would I believe is the romance between you know, very East African elemental aesthetics and um, inventive off-the-grid uh, sustainability. This was 100% off-the-grid. And we looked at this as a model. Um, there have been buildings built on the site subsequently uh, to create a sustainable community uh, for both the community and, and the, this, this uh, 40 acre site is looked at um, by various people in the country as, as well. Burundi is one of the, I think, the fifth poorest country in the world. So, um, yeah. So, as with all of our projects in the early phases of development, we began by immersing ourselves in the, in, in the culture of the community. And here's a video of my impression of the villagers. This is the first time that I approached um, Kikuchu. <laughs> Clothing is colorful and people laugh and it's kind of a very endearing place, particularly for the first time. Um, but then I began to dig a little deeper and here's, a, actually this is a house uh, for one of the residences nearby the site. And then you see on the left, the, you see the exterior and, and again, it's rather charming. But if you look on the interior, you begin to dig a little deeper, you'll notice that there is no real water. Um, that's a big problem that uh, Sharon spoke about. Uh, there's no way to, um, for waste removal. And so the basics of have healthy living are really not in, in, involved in the way that the people live. So uh, this led to a bunch of questions. Um, when you start getting into the weeds uh, that were about questions about sustainability, landscape, collaboration, context, transfer of knowledge, which is a big one, and community building, because they all come into play if you do uh, this kind of work. And so our quest to these answers, you know, really kind of rigorous here, um, we, we dug deeper and deeper to find out what would be a proper way or what was an appropriate project to do 
um, within this, this context. And so what we realized is that the, we observed and participated in a series of what I call hybrid conversations. And the first one was the local conversation, because we noticed that people hung out uh, and, and their conversations were rather communal. They were outdoors, they were informal. This is just this is the, the town of Romone, which is right outside of Kikutu. What would be the global conversation? Because we were, uh, these people are our clients, so we needed to communicate in a way that was reciprocal and engaging, and, and we needed to listen. That was hugely important. And of course, the sustainable conversation. Anything we realized and, and what we learned was that anything we did would have to be, of course, low-tech, land-based, logical, simple as possible, simple and complex. That's, a, that's not so simple. And um, local materials. And then there's the aesthetic conversation. We're all architects here. We're here to do you know, work that makes a lot of sense. Um, both in the community and also in our aesthetic knowledge. So um, we started to look at the aesthetics of the community and, and, and then we realized that there was a symbiotic relationship between the patterns of the craft inherent within the uh, local built form and also the exquisite Burundian landscape. So taken together, these elements became, you know, a kind of an aesthetic armature of how we would design this building. We looked at it as so the building would be um, a reflection of these ideas. And um, so if we incorporate all these things together, I want to show you another short video. And it's a clip where you'll see it's the synthesis of my research, uh, where a cluster of women are sitting in patterned garb sitting in the grass and chatting about how to make sustainable, that they're making sustainable baskets. So here you go. <laughs> Again, on the first doors. 
So the same elemental design moves that established the aesthetics of the building also advanced its sustainability. Because porches are places for optimized uh, ventilation and eliminating there was no possibility of air conditioning here because we are 100% off the grid. So we placed the windows for ventilation, you know, how your rises at, at the top of our walls. Yet, um, porches were great, but they, they were not enough of a design move to uh, deal with the fact that we were 100% off the grid and that um, we were in a net zero situation as of then. So we also included a bunch of other uh, technical um, devices to save energy uh, because there was a nearby solar array uh, which was not that far away on the site but we also had solar water heaters and we cited the building growth rate, which I mentioned, and a series of other um, constant uh, use and attention to sustain sustainable methods. And yet, the greatest efficiency was probably that the, the human efficiency, because what we do here, the villagers use local bricks instead of um, machinery, uh, which would uh, consume fuel to build the building. And we use local labor, uh, which creates transferable, uh, transferable jobs uh, for skills of the members of the community. And just like Sharon said, we, we had daily Skype calls with the community and in the building community during construction. Here you see the beginning, and every day they sent us a picture. and. Every day I ask the question, how many women are on the site? And that was a uh, kind of an ongoing discussion because both men and women, um, just like in Sharon's uh, project, were involved in the construction. Uh, if you learn how to be a plumber or a mason uh, you know, and earn $3 a day, which is a really good salary in Burundi, um, you can live a nice life and take care of your family. So our participation in this project involved a reciprocal exchange of information. So here you see me at the quarry. I was talking to some of these um, construction uh, workers. We were picking out some stone um, that we were going to use in the project. And um, this is an example, just by this chat, of how we learned about the community and simultaneously you know, made some comments to try to improve upon um, maybe some instructional stability and architecture of the projects. And we ended up, the way we did the construction, we, we not only regular construction documents, but we did uh, 57 uh, construction step diagrams. And uh, when we have these Skype calls every day, we refer to step number 15 or step number 16 because you know, the visuals are an international language and everybody understands them. And here you have step 57 at the end, which is a big deal when we, when we reach that. And so um, what do we do here? We use the construction methodology, which is effectively uh, concrete structure and brick infill to build this building, but we amplified it, we strengthened the amount of rebar, we uh, adjusted it um, for seismic concerns, so we worked within the community and then brought additional knowledge to the construction um, jobs, so it was a real reciprocity. So to wrap up, aesthetically intriguing architecture driven by a social imperative is is what I believe is the natural um, instinct of ours to create both uh, beauty and community. And I believe it's within our grasp as architects to um, design um, an inspiring thread of, of emergent architecture in these communities and to keep that duality in, in all the projects that we do. And we can uh, seize the opportunity uh, to initiate and to innovate, and really to become global citizens, because that's one of the best parts of this, this kind of work. Um, you really see the world through a lens of possibility, and, and we can and understand um, 
what it means to create it as what I started out with, the architecture reflective of both art and conscience. Thank you. Um, thank you both uh, for great uh, presentations. And I wanted to you know, jump in a little bit uh, on the questions that, it, uh, you know, sort of being mindful that uh, a year is graduating, you know, in a few weeks. And um, one of the many conversations we have here at the school is how does one as an architect uh, shape the kind of practice that they really, um, that they really wake up every day to engage in, uh, that it's kind of meaningful, that it's, you know, uh, really contributing. And it, it does strike me that, you know, you have very unique practices. I mean, it's not, and I, I'm not generally, you know, you do other things. And so I wanted to uh, kind of situate these, with these current projects relative to the other work that you do, um, but also whether suddenly uh, these, you know, these projects are opening a door that is you know, getting wider, or are there kind of more possibilities, and how um, those kinds of projects are really also then maybe uh, creating a feedback loop in terms of how you practice when you practice here, uh, and you know, what is that relationship? Because you know, clearly you set up in motion uh, certain, you know, very uh, uh, sort of uh, atypical, you know, construction processes, whether it's the making of materials on site or, you know, finding notational uh, diagrams to, you know, that are not your typical, you know, construction documents, etc. So that the, the whole construction process is a different process that, uh, the engagement with the community uh, is, is, you know, is kind of a little bit um, different to the idea that you know, the building is not just an object, it is really, you're, you're also thinking about the context very, very broadly. And so all these, uh, you know, just by displacing yourself in this different context, there's a way that you're rediscovering architecture's possibilities and then how does that reflect back work here is maybe a place I wanted to have you elaborate. Sharon, do you want to maybe start or? Yeah. We'll try. <laughs> um, sorry, Dad. Is that working? Okay. Um, well, you mentioned a number of things. So I, I think that um, how it relates to how I practice here um, is an interesting question. For example, uh, when I first graduated, I um, had my, got my lead certification and was very interested in doing, um, you know, lead rated buildings, which requires that your materials come from within 500 miles. But having worked in Rwanda, where we were literally using materials on the site, um, and the focus was, I, mean, I think just logically what I found was, labor's very inexpensive, people need jobs, and materials are very expensive, and especially if you import them. So how can we use, how can we spend more money on labor and less money on materials, sort of the reverse of here? And um, so for me, the, it, talking about bringing something back with me, um, so I don't think of a local materials being within 500 miles. I think of if I'm going to make, a, if I need a stone countertop, it's going to be whatever the stone is that's quarried at the, at the nearest quarry. I'm going to take that as a given, um, not sort of go to a showroom and pick out whatever I think is the coolest um, stone at the moment. So, and I like that because I find it like that it's a design challenge, right? So um, the more you sort of give yourself problems, the more interesting the solutions can become. Um, so that's an answer to one small part of your question. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I think this has to do with um, authenticity and who you are as a person and what your level of comfort is with risk or not. And um, I think I came to terms with the fact that um, I'm entrepreneurial. And I'm comfortable with a certain amount of risk, and I'm always the lover of the long shot. You know, I, I, this is who I am. So, doing this 
work, whether it's in these other countries, or I remember when we were doing a library here in New York City, at Diary Park City, and it was in a building, and I remember kind of suggesting, you know, like, my Zeus still raising my hand and saying, well, why don't we just, you know, the building hadn't been built yet, why don't we just blow out the whole side of the building and um, open the doors uh, and make it like Tanglewood, because this was a library and then there could be this outside situation. So, um, this is, uh, you know, I think you have to, and as students in particular, you, you work in situations that make you feel comfortable or where you feel most natural. And, and if you start, whether it's in, in New York or, or in Portugal or any of these other places, you realize the world is pretty small and that people are people and they may look a little different and this and that, but everybody pretty well want to, I found people want a lot of the same things. And um, so you figure out a way, like Sharon was saying, wherever you are, to kind of move towards um, doing architecture the very best you can. And it's different in different places, but I think you have to be comfortable taking initiative. And if that's your personality, then maybe some of this work might be a good idea for you. Yeah. I also think, just, just to pick up on something that you said, that when you're in architecture school, the work you're doing is, you're so passionate about the work you're doing. You're, you have interesting assignments, um, you're looking at the cutting edge of everything. And then you graduate, and you're most probably doing interiors or an office building or an apartment building or something like that. So how do you find a way as, a, as an architect to retain the passion that you started out with? And it, it's different for everyone, but just finding that passion somehow in the, in the work that you end up doing. And sometimes that means going to Rwanda or Burundi to, to find that. Um, but it is, this kind of work is very satisfying. Um, I have to say, it's very rewarding. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I, I love going to work. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm not one of those angry architects. I really enjoy work. I look forward to getting up in the morning and thinking about these things. And um, But one piece of advice for you, young people based on what Sharon said is that in order to go out and do these things I think it's very important to understand construction which is not what we talked about all in school I mean there was zero discussion actually no I, I did go to Yale and we had the building we had a building project which was a little bit towards construction but um, I'm working on a competing project here oh good, good, good. no it's, it's helpful but at those jobs that you're going to, where you're doing these interiors or whatever you're doing, I think it would be great to learn as much about its construction as you can. And that's sort of, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a big bureaucrat, uh, but I understand the purpose of getting registered or licensed because, in a way, that means you, it's sort of certifying that you understand construction. Because once you understand some of the basic parameters of construction, then you can move it around and do interesting things with it. Uh, but it's not just line drawings, you know? It's, you have sort of a working knowledge of capacity, and then you can change those things. And so those early years out of school are a great opportunity um, to, to, I mean, learn about plumbing. Or, you know, and then you can learn how to make plumbing more sustainable. I mean, it, it's a step-by-step -step process. Well, certainly, I think the kind of, these are kinds of, these are very specific projects that are, um, I think, also fulfilling because they bring everything together to a scale that you can be really engaged in as, a, as an architect. And I think that's, that's very particular and very different from, you know, the blown-up scale of projects that you know, many architects are, most architects are engaged with now where, you know, unless it's broken up in little pieces where you are assembling experts, uh, it, it's become very hard to have that totality. And, and I think what's really incredible in those kinds of projects is the satisfaction of being hands-on, bringing all your knowledge together, whether it's about 
people use about the history of the site or the history of architecture. I mean, it is architecture and it's, and it's most, most satisfying. And I think that that's um, kind of really, uh, you know, interesting to, to compare what we've gained and what we've lost with scale. And, and you know, you start with scale as your kind of, you know, first, first problem, which is, you know, what is the scale? Of these, you know, women getting together, or um, mm. and, uh, and you both mentioned uh, also aesthetics, of course, and there's a real sensibility in the work. And I was curious how, um, uh, you know, what was the relationship which was triangulated by right, between the community and then the NGO or the client and, and you? What was that triangle in terms of the kind of aesthetic uh, desires, yours, the community's, and and then and how the buildings were received at the end, and you know whether that is kind of also transforming future construction. Um, um, so I felt, in retrospect, I felt very fortunate that the first job that I had involved um, women in a classroom where I could sit down and hear what they had to say, and I had a translator available. And they were art, their conversation was already happening. I just had to sit there and listen to it. Um, typically, you don't have that. Um, and so you have to create that environment for, your, for yourself. So in the, um, the second project that I was talking about, we also did a plan for the entire town, a master plan. And we brought the community members together and had them actually do their own charrettes. So first they drew, and they were incredibly meticulous and accurate. They drew their own homes, and then they drew their dream homes, and then they got together and uh, in smaller groups proposed different elements of the community and then stood up and presented them to each other. Um, so, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. What were, were we going with aesthetic, that? Aesthetic <laughs> sensibility or the kind of converging uh, yes. desires to towards that building. Right, right. Well, and as you can see, even at $45 a square foot, you can make something that's beautiful and um, uh, livable and uh, comfortable. And so those are the things to me that are important, especially as I look at countries like Rwanda, where every time I go there, I see more and more huge buildings in the, in the capital, and they're almost always made with concrete and then more and more glass. Well, glass is the craziest thing to build with there because they don't open the windows. And here you have this sort of perfect climate, all it needs is shade, and everyone's locked inside these glass towers, and there's no air conditioning, and there shouldn't be air conditioning because they have no power. So, um, uh, yeah, it's just, it can be frustrating to see the direction that growth goes in and what they think they want versus what actually would work well for them um, in their climate and in their uh, whatever the program that's they're working on. Well, that aesthetics, um, aesthetics are really important. You know, just slapping things together here, we're doing architecture. And I guess the collaborative relationship with clients really understand where they're coming from. Uh, we would always really spend a lot of time listening, and we do this on all jobs, really listening to where the client is coming from. And then I guess the truth is, we always then see, can we amplify that? Can we make it, um, I mean, like in Portugal, for example, they didn't say, oh, we want a museum with a green roof on it. I think I noticed that there was a hill there, and um, it was, you know, when we were standing there at the very beginning, and the first design we showed them had a green roof on it. And we said, win-win, you know, insulate your building. Um, this is a tiny little town. This is a town center. It would be your central park in the middle of Boticas, which is a tiny little town. And the mayor went like, yes, you know, because they I mean, he got the sense from the listening that they were um, very interested in, um, you know, building up this town. And, and, region, in fact, because the uh, artist was born in this section of Portugal and ended up living in uh, Lisbon, outside of Lisbon, uh, later on in life, and wanted to bring um, his work 
back to that area of the country. Uh, the clients there, I find the clients who work well with this with this method are generally those who are a little more expansive mm -hmm. and who are receptive to thinking about you know about possibilities. And so when we say something, I it usually goes this way. We, we sort of say, show the picture, or show the you know, the model with the, with, with the green group on it that they were not expecting, and then there's this like dead silence, and then you're there, and, and then you sort of talk about it, and then they go, if they are receptive, and they go, yeah, yeah, uh huh, and it sort of starts, it takes a while for sometimes some new ideas to percolate, and then they make comments that modify our ideas, and it becomes a real collaboration. Um, and I think the second point about aesthetics that's really important is to study, if you're doing buildings that are situated in different places, we weren't going to do in Africa what we did in Portugal. I mean, they're just different, and they're in different communities. Not that they shouldn't all be aesthetic holes, but thinking about the history of these places and trying to dig deep into what is the notion of, of, of African pattern. It's very interesting, all the clothing that you see on these women um, very colorful and, and pattern is actually Dutch. It's not indigenously African, but over the years it's become sort of an African appearance and an African aesthetic, the pattern, because the women took it on, you know, and women and men, you know, and, and so so then what is an aesthetic that sort of starts in Europe, maybe, and this is a whole large conversation about Africa, it's about who's in control of the situation, which is actually very complex and, and, and um, fascinating. But aesthetics are about reciprocity and taking initiative, I think. So um, I think maybe I should open it up because I want to make sure we have the time to, uh, to have some questions from our students and the audience. You mentioned that Women for Women is in eight countries or eight? Eight. Okay, and they're all in Africa? Uh, no, they actually started in former Yugoslavia um, uh, and started in um, Sarajevo and Kosovo, um, then moved to Africa and then into the Middle East. Interesting. So uh, if you could both of, them, both of them tell us a little bit about how either the clients found you or you found them because they sound like very interesting NGOs. Are they headquartered in New York? Uh, the Women for Women is headquartered in D.C. Um, it was completely serendipitous. Um, I have a friend who is a, um, a consultant for NGOs. She helps them with marketing and PR. And well, this it, actually this is relevant. I think. So in the, they were in New York City or in D.C. A table of women, because it's all women board members. One woman announces that the government's giving them this land. Another woman raises her hand and says, okay, I'll fund it. And then they all look around and say, we need a female architect. And nobody knew the name of the female architect in that room. Except my friend, who knew me, and I had just graduated it. So, um, but the donor and the founder came to meet with me, and they were both huge risk takers. The, the donor was an artist, and she came up with this brick-making idea. And, and I kind of said to them, you know, there are female architects that you could hire. But we all just hit it off, and so off we went. Yeah, no, the, my, my firm is working in Afghanistan quite a bit, and, mm -hmm. and part of our current contract with the U.S. government is uh, gender capacity building for women. Mm -hmm. So we work uh, in our office with women, and we're building a building for our women's dormitory at the American University. I'm just curious. This NGO in Afghanistan, you know? Um, I, I know that it, it has been. I'm not in touch with them so much. Um, I mean, I don't know so much about what's happening there right now. Um, but they have been in, in Afghanistan, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that Like you don't know me, but um, from this woman, um, 
you know, I'm the executive director of Village Health Works. And um, we're looking to build, a, it was also a women's, the project started as a women's health pavilion. So she was very interested in the fact that we had done um, affordable housing. I guess the woman thing was important as well. And, uh, and that we did it on a tight budget, because that was their situation. And so she, we met and we talked. She's a very compelling person. She actually is my client to this day in other capacities. She's no longer at Village Health Works. And um, she said, well, uh, I, I met her, and I actually had no idea where one of was. So I got off the phone, and I went on Google Maps, and I looked up, and I said, oh, here it is, you know? <laughs> and, um, and we met, and, and we hit it off. And then she said, um, well, you know, we're having this board meeting in Kabutu in two and a half weeks. And uh, would you like to come? It was like one of those things. And so I said, just give me 24 hours, you know. What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I went on about it, and I got on the plane. And that was it. And it, it really is kind of an idiosyncratic experience. That's Sorry, I keep talking. Yeah. Uh, quick, similar story. We won a project in Burkina Faso, and I had no idea where it was, and I had to Google. A similar story about Burkina Faso, uh, just trying to find it on the map. It's next to Ghana, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I'm interested in your yeah. um, practice model. There's a, a brother firm to the two of yours, the Mass Design Group, which I'm, people here are probably more plugged in than I am. But I was very intrigued at the Architecture Record uh, conference they uh, presented by Parkage. and. That practice is a nonprofit because your clients are not profits, but he's, he's like executive director, you know, not president. And maybe at the end of the day it doesn't make a difference, but I, I in terms of business practice of architecture, I thought that was revolutionary, that the practice itself, the design firm, is a nonprofit. And and his work or their work is, is very much like your beautiful stuff, Elijah in Africa, Haiti, very sustainable. You know, it works with the low footprint, uh, you know, low density. So, so Michael was um, in his third year at Harvard when he went over there. And when I first Googled Rwanda architecture after I was introduced to this client, the only thing, that, yeah, Rwanda architecture, the only thing that came up was a picture of Michael still as a student doing his first project there. So I sort of followed him along. They, they, you know, they're huge now and they're doing things in many countries. And they've done. He's done a great job of collaborating with other nonprofits that will do things like provide students to come and work with someone with them. Or he, he's been great at uh, sort of in-kind donations. I guess I'm say of people or a staff or whatever. And. He goes to every global conference that nonprofits are at, and he spends a huge amount of time fundraising, and it's very impressive. Um, Louise can attest to, I tried to start a nonprofit to run so that I could choose my own projects and not be dependent on a client to bring me a project, and Louise was on my board. And um, honestly, after five years, I was so tired of the administrative part of it because you're, you're a nonprofit, you're responsible to New York State, and there are a lot of rules and regulations, and um, you spend most of your time asking for money and making your case um, and trying to follow all these regulations. There's not a lot of time left over for design. So I think I'd love to love work for Michael, but I wouldn't want to be Michael. <laughs> so. Sharon and I would meet, and we both have our own firms, and they're relatively, you know, boutique type firms. And we would meet once, once a month for breakfast, and we'd share resources, engineers. It was like we were a larger group because we had each other. It was a very, a very lovely relationship. And then I was on her board for um, her nonprofit. I agree with Sharon. First of all, these projects are labor intensive. There's a lot of work involved, and if you have a staff and you want to pay people equitably, um, uh, I mean, 
the issue of pro bono also comes up a lot in this, and it's, it's really, it, other than doing a sketch and handing it over to somebody, which is not what we do, I, neither of us, um, it, it's, this pro bono thing is not something that's feasible for my, for my office. Uh, but, you know, there are different strokes for different folks, so everybody works differently. Um, I am actively involved in design, just like Sharon is, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be a traditional firm. But it's really interesting to me, though, what it says about the state of the practice that in order for us to, to contribute to, you know, social change or, you know, that we would have we're starting to be, have to become non-profits, which we all are to some extent, but, but that, that it has to be, I, 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 because I, I think that it's, I mean, for me it's a question, there's been a lot of, you know, talk about, uh, you know, contributing and social engagement, and, 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 and I think it's great, and I kind of want to, you know, um, but, but, you know, at the same time, if there's been this drop in fees, and architects are supposed to, or faster, uh, more, you know, it's, it's become harder and harder to, I mean, I, I don't want to now start complaining, but, but, you know, I mean, competitions, it used to be a competition office, competition offices used to do very well, it's impossible to survive as a competition office. So it's interesting to, to note, though, that paradigm shift to where there is a kind of recognition. It's, it's pragmatic, right? It's a recognition of that, well, this is the kind of work I want to do the only way I mean, you're finding a different way. That's why I'm, I'm also interested in the practice as a whole and, and how we balance things out. But it, it does say something about where we are that you're starting to have some profit models as a, as a model, really. So I would say um, a couple of things. One is um, a friend of mine, John Kerry, wrote the book, The Power of Pro Bono. And it's a great book, but interestingly, he's now moved on to something else and he no longer really believes in the power of pro bono. Um, in the sense that, um, that you, lose, you lose a sense of value, which is really key to the process. And, and then when you lose a sense of value, you lose a sense of timing as well. So the client relationship changes dramatically. And you can get yourself into a, well, let's just redesign it, let's just redesign it. You know, it's not, it's not a healthy place for the architect or for the, or for the client to be in. Um, but I do find I get very involved in this fundraising. So I will sometimes um, do a, a shorter contract that is for schematic design and then for certain um, renderings to help them or I will show up at a, at a cocktail party where they're trying to raise money and I'll explain what the design is. That kind of thing um, I think can be very helpful to the client. But it is it's also a long road. If you're starting with a client and they're still trying to figure out how they're going to raise the money, it's going to be years before you actually build something. So it takes a lot of patience, too. Um, uh, I just well, I find that presentation is fascinating, and, uh, but it also makes me think of, um, you know, all sorts of things, like I come to the temple used to be called first versus third worlds, you know, the way there is an echo, for example, I'm thinking about this question of labor, and the, the use of labor uh, to build, you know, because people need jobs. And then you are left with the question, but after you build the building, then what happens to that, you know? And then, I, which reminds me of the situation in, in the so-called first world, where clearly you know, this question of employment is a nightmare, you know, mm -hmm. in this country, or you know, this kind of declining industrial base you know, being eaten alive by outside giants that can produce you know, this stuff for so much less, like the Chinese steel industry versus the United States, right? They never can, can't compete, and that crisis of labor, you know, that is still there, but also here, as I end up asking the question, well, these guys who start to women work on these buildings, and then what after the building is completed? Yes. What happens to them then? Well, I, have, I don't think this is true for all the people that work on my pro have worked on my projects, um, but one of the most satisfying moments of that project was towards the very end, um, as we were preparing for the opening, 
and it was all coming down to the last minute, um, the project manager called me and said, oh my god, all the Masons are leaving because there's a government project now down the road and they want to hire our Masons because we're the only one that have, we're the ones that have skilled Masons and everyone else is basically unskilled. So they had an ad in the paper saying, if you've worked at the Women's Center, we're gonna, you know, you get the job first, right? So obviously that doesn't happen to everyone. And the Women's Brick Cooperative has gone through kind of ups and downs of being able to sustain itself. Um, so it, it's definitely an issue. Sometimes it has a happy ending. Sometimes it has a happy ending. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say there's also an issue. Um, Africa is wide open right now, and there are many other people coming in that with a huge uh, influx from both the Middle East and also China workers uh, who are there who may be already pre organized and a little more. Um, they have the machinery, for example. I'll give you a, a story. Um, we were on one of these calls, and, and so the engineer said, uh, and for the concrete, we had to do a slum test. You know, and bring slum tests, I'm sure you've learned about that instruction. Yeah, right. Anything, right. Anyway, so there's a dead silence on the other end of the call, and um, they obviously didn't notice. And he said, and we have to bring this to a lab, you know, the test. And there was no idea of what a lab is. So um, they found a lab. They're very resourceful, yeah, resourceful people. We had the next day at the conference call. We found a lab. It's in Bujumbura. Do the sum test, blah, 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 blah. Bring the sum test into the lab, and the concrete fails. Uh, so that happened three more times. And so then the engineer's question was, and we did a lot of pictures. Take a picture of exactly, you know, what was this cement line, and what was this stone line, and, and what did you put in the mix? And, and this site is adjacent to Lake Tanganyika, which is right down the hill. So apparently they were putting um, river rocks in the concrete, which was smooth as opposed to aggregate, which sort of connects to the cement and, and, and strengthens the cement. And then the, the news was that we needed to chop up the river rocks or get aggregate. And so they didn't have the machine. Who had the machine? The Chinese company down the road. So for a steep, steep <laughs> price, they chopped up, they, they came with the aggregate. <laughs> And that goes to show you that they had the machine, and that becomes, these are issues about yeah. first world, and, and Africa is on the move right now. I mean, I always hear the conversation, this is not one place, Africa is a continent, not a country. Sure, sure. Yeah, but these are issues mm. of, I think, ethics also. It's yeah, down course, to, you course, know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I started to think when you talked about going to Rwanda and seeing the glass mm -hmm. building. And I thought, well, outside investment is coming in to build these things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they want what they want. Yes. Because they think their, their investment will be guaranteed by having something like this. Because they got it from the first world, right? This is a, so, you know, yes. it, dealing with that is a huge issue. Um, President yeah. Kagame um, would like the capital city of Kigali to look like Singapore. Yeah, right. But there's none of the natural resources for powering a city that looks like Singapore. <laughs> no, but I think it's true, and there's something uh, I think that the people I've met with want modern buildings. They do, and I don't, I don't think that's so bad. If you think about, well, what is modern in the African context, it's a very interesting problem. I mean, what is modern there? I mean, but you know, it's like something's been gone over before because when all these countries got independent, when they had these ex, you know, uh, colonial imperial architects doing buildings which were an attempt at the kind of hybrid of what might be modern for Africa. Right. You know? mm -hmm. But then this, this knowledge and just gets lost, yeah. you know, it's like... Well, I don't think it gets lost. I spent a lot of time looking at Shadrach Woods, all those projects that were dug at that time. I think architects today go back. Oh, I agree, but the, the, the politicians, the society, loses, mm -hmm. uh, the desire, you know, maybe, because they then jump to this other image. Right. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't. I think yeah. so, but I think, I think it's, it's really complex and interesting for them, because I think, Today, I mean, that period in, you know, 
the, the end of late modernism was fascinating. Um, what was going on in Africa and the show at, at the AIA right now is, mm -hmm. is, is, it shows all that. And the new book. And the new book and Ingrid Vaughn's pictures and, and, and it's a, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, it's a great show. But it is, that's probably more European, Eurocentric, I guess you call it. Yeah, right. But still it's making a kind of effort. Yes, uh, yes, to, yes. And I think people are doing it today, look, not only look at that effort, I did. I, I looked at all that work. I thought it was fascinating. And a, a stepping off point, and um, it's great. Well, I think architects are looking at that work. But if you're a developer developing a building, as you would be any other place, you're not looking at any kind of work here. You know. We're holding out the AC. Yeah, because we're holding out. I mean, you know, I think architects are very much you know, in tune with the fact that that's a legacy and that one can work with really in really productive ways. But I think, I mean, to get Ken's point, these cities are not necessarily getting low with, with architects, and, and as are most cities. So, but I think if there's education out there in a way that and distribution, yeah, but I mean, the, the issue is here as well, right? I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. right as in yeah. New York is. You know. <laughs> uh, so, so I think we're having an issue here. Yeah, no, I think you know, that's what I mean. You know, the, what seems to be there and so-called, you know, is actually it, here. It's also here and in a slightly not, not such a dissimilar that's form right. here. Great. Well, thank you both. It was really inspiring and uh, great to send, send off right, to everybody, the few that are still in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one who's trying to review. So, uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.